is take three of a lecture for professional responsibility about the Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.11. The Code of Judicial Conduct is tested on the MPRE, but it's a lightly tested subject. It's one of the least tested subjects. In fact, you will probably only have about four questions um, about the Code of Judicial Conduct on your MPRE exam. And the code itself is as important as it is, and judicial ethics are a very, very important subject, is <clears throat> as uh, extensive almost as the, uh, the model rules for lawyers. And so uh, it's, uh, in, in my view, it's a little too much to learn. We could do a whole semester course on it, for only four questions on the MPRE. Also keep in mind that a, a fair portion of the Code of Judicial Conduct is either rather obvious, you know, things like judges shouldn't take bribes or um, act with prejudice and so on, um, or is reciprocal and therefore redundant with the model rules for lawyers. As an example, we have um, a uh, prohibition for lawyers in the model rules on ex parte contacts with judges and we're gonna have a reciprocal rule about judges having ex parte contacts with the, the lawyers in, in a pending matter uh, before them. And um, this means that this, as a student, if you already knew the model rules for lawyers, you probably would have been able to guess that question correctly um, because it's a reciprocal rule. By the way, this type of redundancy is very helpful in rule systems because of uh, imperfect enforcement, imperfect compliance with the rules. And so if we can find a way to make the rule binding on both parties or both sides of a transaction, um, it can really help. So let's move on. <clears throat> and I mentioned this in a another lecture just to review for my students. There's something uh, structurally different about the Code of Judicial Conduct from the model rules for lawyers, and that is it starts with being divided into four canons or sort of big subject areas, but these aren't, they're not subject areas as much as uh, it's like a, a meta rule, a, an overarching rule or, or character trait the judges should have, and then the rules are fit under these. And so in another lecture, for example, I do 3.6, and we uh, have to start with Canon 3. All of the three, there's 15 rules and then many, many comments and subsections uh, put under Canon 3. Today, we're gonna be talking about 2.11, which is under Canon 2. A judge shall perform the duties of judicial office impartially, competently, and diligently. <clears throat> now, if you look at Canon 2 here, by the way, I know this is a terribly cluttered slide. I just want my students to see really quickly, there's 16 different rules under Canon 2, and each of these rules has multiple sections at like A, B, C, D sections, and then subsections, one, two, three, or things like that under the rule itself. So there's really a lot to talk about here, but today we're only going to talk about 2.11 disqualification which um, a lot of people in, in some jurisdictions or lay people outside the law would have called recusal. This is when judges recuse themselves um, or pass a case to a different judge, excuse themselves from a case. We call it commonly um, in, in our in pop culture, recusal, but here we're gonna talk about disqualification. Now, wow, what a terrible slide. Look at that, you, there's no way you can read that. Um, I'm doing this to give you just a quick roadmap to the rest of this lecture so you can see we have an A section that has um, six parts and section parts two and or subparts two and six each have four sub subparts kind of. And then we have a B and a C that are pretty straightforward rules that we'll get to at the end of the lecture. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about is gonna be the six subsections of A. So here's the first part of A. A judge shall disqualify himself or herself in any proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, including, but not limited to, the following circumstances. And by the way, before I move on to what those circumstances are, and remember there's going to be six from that previous awful cluttered slide I showed you, um, the, 
it, it, the question is not whether the judge subjectively could be fair or subjectively is biased, but whether it would be reasonable for other people to question the judge's impartiality. And so we're going to have some concern about even the appearance of impropriety or the appearance of bias, even for a judge who doesn't care. And to give a, just a quick example, um, let's say you're a judge and one of the parties in the case is your, um, <clears throat> your spouse or your twin brother or your, um, uh, your, uh, one of your parents. And well, to reasonable people, it's gonna look like not fair for you to be the judge. They assume you're gonna be biased towards immediate family members. That being said, of course, there are plenty of people who hate their immediate family members, who are estranged from their parents, who can't stand their, um, uh, their sister or brother or something like that and never speak to them, haven't talked to them in decades and so forth. So maybe they could be, actually, the bias would go the other way. Uh, we don't care. It would be reasonable for other people to assume that you're biased. Okay, so here's our first, um, uh, our, our first subcategory of um, appearance of bias where you should recuse or disqualify yourself. The judge has personal bias or prejudice concerning a party or a party's lawyer or personal knowledge of the facts that are in dispute in the proceeding. So here we're not just talking about overall um, bias on, let's say, issues. So maybe the judge is an, uh, was, uh, before coming to the bench, was a party operative in one of the parties and is uh, sort of a <clears throat> hardcore partisan, a very, very left wing or very, very right wing or something like that. And so maybe we think that all conservative judges are, uh, are biased or all uh, progressive or liberal judges are biased. That's not what this rule is talking about. This is specific to the parties. And so there's something, um, uh, so here's your classic situation. One of the parties is your ex who you can't stand, uh, who ruined your life or something like that. Um, someone who uh, stole your credit card numbers and, um, and forced you into bankruptcy. There's some reason you have a personal grudge against this person or a deep, deep dislike um, <clears throat> for them. They're somehow, uh, they associate uh, with you um, in, in a way that you, no one trusts you to be fair towards this particular person. Could also be that the judge has firsthand knowledge of the facts of the case, in which case we're also going to have a problem because judges are supposed to rely on the representations of the parties. Okay, this, and this, by the way, not, this slide is not my proudest achievement. I think it's kind of ugly and I spent hours working on it and you would never, and it really wasn't worth it. I should just have put the text up here. But um, A2, A2 is when the judge knows that the judge's spouse or domestic partner or a person within the third degree of relationship to either of them or the spouse or domestic partner of such a person. So here's our little icon of a nice little nuclear family. Um, pause. What are we, why are there asterisks everywhere in this rule? Well, for whatever reason, stylistically in the code of judicial conduct, we put asterisks next to terms that are specifically defined terms in the definition section. And so when you see an asterisk, well, um, like third degree of relationship, and you're like, well, could reasonable minds differ about what's the third degree of relationship? Not in this case, because we've actually defined it for the code. There's an asterisk there. Look it up if you have a question about it. Now, um, uh, first, the, this person who's like, let's say your partner that your or spouse is one of the parties to the proceeding or is a director or on the board of directors of a corporate party to the proceeding. Well, that's not fair. Obviously, we think the judge should recuse himself or herself if their spouse is one of the parties. We, it will at least be reasonable for it to look like it's biased to other people and we don't want that, it undermines faith in the judiciary, so you should recuse yourself. Number two, um, someone close to you, your spouse is one of the lawyers. So not one of the parties, but one of the lawyers in the proceeding, then the judge should recuse himself you, or herself. You should not be the judge um, in a case where your spouse or your, your life partner um, <clears throat> or one of your children or your mom or dad or your brother-in-law even, is the lawyer in the case. And I have two here uh, next. This is your spouse, your parent, your brother-in-law or uh, a sibling or someone like that um, has a more than a de minimis, uh, de minimis financial interest that could, is at stake in this proceeding, in this particular proceeding. 
Now, please note, more than de minimis. And so there could be some incidental thing, right? This is your spouse's dry cleaners and their dry cleaner is one of the parties. And um, actually your, your spouse owes the, still owes the dry cleaner $10 on an unpaid bill. That's a de minimis. We don't really think that that's going to affect how you decide a case necessarily that's going to trial. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, if they have a lot of their uh, uh, pension invested with this one of the parties, that's what we care about. Next, um, your spouse or immediate family member or, someone, or partner is likely to be a material witness. And please notice material, don't fall for a gotcha question that has your spouse has to do something very cursory, like uh, authenticate a document that's not even really in dispute just for the sake of admitting it to the record. We're talking about a material witness, someone who's gonna testify about a matter that could affect the outcome of the case. Okay, moving on to three. This is 211A3. The judge knows that, that he or she individually or as a fiduciary or your spouse, domestic partner, parent, child, or any other member of the judge's family that lives with you. Notice here we don't have third degree. Now we're talking about who lives under the same roof as you, has an economic interest in the subject um, or is a party to the proceeding. So this could be someone who, um, a family member who lives with you, it might not <clears throat> apply to a sibling, let's say, um, who lives in another state or something like that, but that somehow they have uh, some uh, um, economic interest in the subject matter, even if it's not um, as one of the parties. And so maybe, for example, um, the, this is, uh, as an example, in an intellectual property case, um, we have someone who's claiming to be a patent holder suing a patent infringer, and you, one of your grown child uh, 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 children is also a potential patent infringer of the same patent, um, even though they're not a party to this particular matter. Well, th they have a type of um, economic interest in this matter. You should recuse yourself. Next, the judge knows or learns by means of a timely motion that a party or the party's lawyer or the, one of the firms that's involved in the case has made um, uh, substantial contributions. Wow, this is an annoying phrase rule. You'll see all these brackets where they were hoping states would fill in specific numbers. So um, within the certain number, some number of years has made an aggregate contribution to the judge's campaign in an amount greater than, and you're supposed to specify, um, and, <clears throat> and then they clarify. So if you get a test question about this rule, it's going to be asked. It's going to say that this is a major donor to the this elected judge's campaigns. Five. This is a somewhat different rule. This is where the judge has made public statements that commit or appear to commit the judge to reach a particular result or rule, in to, or to rule in a particular way in a in a controversy. And so, let's say when you are running for judicial office you take a strong stand on, uh, we'll pick abortion, and, and say that you adamantly um, oppose abortion, that you're very, very strongly pro-life, that you will grab the first opportunity you can find to overturn Roe v. Wade, <clears throat> and things like that. And this was kind of a, one of your talking points. You've said publicly that you would always rule against um, Planned Parenthood, no matter what the case was and no matter what the facts were, that's the type of thing where, guess what? Now you've just got yourself uh, recused from, the, you have to recuse yourself from the case. It would be reasonable for you to recuse yourself from the case. The same could go the other way, right? You're very, very pro-choice and you have made statements that you aren't going to allow uh, uh, any uh, uh, possible encroachment on abortion rights and things like that because it's very, you're very passionate about it and so forth. And now we have some sort of regulatory enforcement action against um, an unlicensed uh, enforcement uh, abortion provider um, or a medical malpractice suit against an abortion provider or something like that. And we are, it's reasonable for people to feel like you have pre-committed. Now, I do want to say something for my students here in case you're wondering about this. What about those U.S. Supreme Court justice confirmation hearings with the Senate, where the senators, it goes on for days and days of <clears throat> the senators on the Judiciary Committee trying to put 
the nominee on the spot saying, do you commit yourself here and now to overturn Citizens United or do you plan to overturn Roe v. Wade and things like that? Now, two things to keep in mind. First, the settled law in this area or the, um, and the position, current position of the U.S. Supreme Court is that the Code of Judicial Conduct actually does not apply um, to the U.S. Supreme Court. It applies to everybody but them. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that that I'm not going to talk about right now. But um, it, it seems to be um, a re, it, uh, solid authority, let's say, for the proposition that the U.S. Supreme Court because it's a court of last resort and they can't, if somebody recuses themselves from the case, there's not a majority and on and on and on. There, there's a whole bunch of reasons this doesn't apply to them. Um, on the other hand, uh, if it was any other type of judge, like let's say a nominee for, the, um, for one of the circuit courts, it, that judge really should not commit themselves, oh, absolutely, I'm gonna overturn Roe v. Wade no matter what, or I, I would never overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, or, or diminish Roe v. Wade, or I am never going to um, uh, overturn Citizens United, things, and, and on and on and on. And so it's, I think it's inappropriate for the um, senators to try to get judges to pre-commit to ruling a certain way, and um, it would be inappropriate for judicial con candidate to pre-commit, we have another rule about that, to ruling a certain way, and if they did and then got confirmed, when a case actually comes up, they have to recuse themselves. So that was kind of a waste of public commitment. All right, six, and sorry, this one has to be broken out into two slides because it has four parts. And all of these, before you get lost in this, um, it's, very, it's a very tedious sub-provision of the rule, uh, subsection, uh, is basically the judge was involved in the case at a previous stage in the, in, um, the procedural history. And so I want my students to imagine a situation. I'm gonna go off the slide for a moment. Um, I want you to imagine a situation where be maybe before you became a judge, um, you worked on a case, you were one of the lawyers for a case, uh, you testified as a witness in, the, in a case or something like that. And, um, and now that the case has gone up on appeal, you have been appointed to the appellate court. And so obviously you should recuse yourself. Right? That's what we're gonna say from a case on, on appeal that you as a pe an appellate judge, you worked as the trial judge or the trial lawyer or something like that. So if it was your own case, then you shouldn't review that on appeal. If you were the lawyer in the case, you shouldn't review it on appeal and so forth. Please note that this could also happen with cases that go up on appeal and are gonna come back down on remand and maybe the normally it's gonna go back to the same judge, but what if it doesn't? What if that judge has retired and, um, and we need to assign it to someone else, then that could kick in to applying this rule. So that's the background here. So if you served as the lawyer in a matter of controversy or someone from your firm did, then you have to recuse yourself um, from a later stage in the proceeding, from being a judge in a later stage. You were the government lawyer, that's the uh, um, B here, and or you were some other government official, you were the head of an agency or a deputy director of an agency and very involved in the litigation as a government lawyer, um, even if it wasn't your case. Um, and so uh, necessarily, but uh, uh, like you weren't the trial lawyer but you were a lawyer for the government who um, was heavily involved in the matter. Obviously, now that you're a judge or for some reason it comes to you as a judge, you can't be the judge in that case. Next, you were a material witness at an earlier stage in the proceedings, like when it was on, at trial, or you previously presided over it a, in another court. And so here again, we're not just talking about a remand for a retrial type situation. We're talking about you are the state judge, now you've been appointed as a federal judge, and the case in a later stage of the proceedings is now being reheard in federal, has been transferred to federal court for some reason. Well, again, you're involved with one of your prior decisions. Okay, B, this one is pretty easy. The judge shall keep informed about the judge's personal and fiduciary economic interests and make reasonable efforts to keep informed about the personal economic interests of your spouse or domestic partner and minor children laying uh, in your household. In other words, 
some judges uh, just don't really think about their money or don't really know where their retirement is invested and stuff like that. Now, we're going to get to this in the comments. If you're invested in a large pension fund or mutual fund and you're not controlling what stocks you have and things like that, um, that, that is not going to be a violation. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about things where you just tell your stock, your stock broker calls you and says, hey, it's time to buy this stock. And you say, do it. And then you promptly forget all about it. And you couldn't answer as somebody if they to asked you what stocks do you own. Um, the same is true if your, your spouse or domestic partner kind of uh, controls a lot of finances or you don't really know where, they've been, where they are investing their money. You need to be informed. Why? so that you're not ambushed by a disqualification or recusal motion to recuse um, at trial so that you can kind of see it coming and know, uh-oh, here comes a case, it's been assigned to me, <clears throat> and I or my partner or my minor child, and you may be saying, why is your minor kid investing in the stock market? Maybe your minor child has inherited money. Like imagine a situation like that um, is an heir, and so um, that, that's why we care. They're designated as an heir. Okay, C, and I know the slide looks a little different, but I had to break C into two rules. This is a, um, a waiver for disqualification. And this is where the judge is going to disclose um, <clears throat> their stake in the case or personal, what, what might be disqualifying them in the case and let the parties and their lawyers decide if they want to have the judge recuse himself or herself or assign it to, and assign it to another judge or if they just wanna keep going. Um, don't assume that the parties always want another judge. This could be a courthouse where there's only two or three judges and both of the parties actually are really happy with which judge, the, the judge they, they got assigned it to and the other two would be much worse for them or for one of them or something like that. So it, it may be that the parties actually do wanna waive this or that they like the judge. They think this judge knows a lot about this area and, and the trial is gonna go smoothly. The judge is really efficient and they don't wanna get it reassigned to a judge who has lots of backlog on their docket or something like that. So um, now this does not apply to your personal um, stuff under A1. So um, you, if your ex is one of the parties or one of the lawyers, you can't ask for them to waive that because we will forever question um, your bias. But if it's um, A2 through 6 or B, um, and so A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, um, or uh, 211B, then you can disclose it. It has to be on the record. This isn't going to be a private conversation in chambers. It's put on the record and becomes part of the record for review on appeal. And the parties have to be given an opportunity, to, an opportunity to discuss it and make their decision outside the presence of the judge or the judge's spies, like the judge's clerks or um, uh, other court personnel, uh, whether to waive disqualification. And if they do, then they're gonna have to put their waiver on the record. If they agree, the parties and lawyers agree without participation from the judge that the judge should not be disqualified, the judge can go ahead and proceed. You may, this may remind my students of informed consent confirmed in writing to waive a conflict of interest. So it is actually very analogous to that because we're usually talking about the judge having some sort of technical conflict of interest and the parties um, agreeing to waive that and then the judge can proceed with the case. This agreement has to be incorporated, whether it's a written agreement or is going to be spoken in court and, and put on the record. Let's move through the comments. Comment um, the one under 211, you should be aware. Um, it, it basically says, um, you have to, we have two important things here. <clears throat> you, if you uh, are disqualified under A1 through A6, you have a duty to recuse yourself, whether the other parties um, ask you to or not. And so, um, and we're, I'm sorry, we're going to get to that. And also you are going to be disqualified if there's some other conflict of interest that's not even, for some reason we didn't think of or isn't specifically mentioned under the rules, but would be obvious and would make people question your impartiality. Next, please notice this last sentence on the slide. Recusal and disqualification are used interchangeably. It's kind of the local legal community that you're in. The ABA uses disqualification. We're not talking about your eligibility to be a judge. 
we're talking about whatever most people I think call recusal. Okay, this is the burden shifting um, uh, or, or the affirmative duty that I was talking about a moment ago. You have an obligation not to hear matters where disqualification is required regardless of whether somebody files a motion. So just because the, uh, the lawyers, this isn't a what they don't know can't hurt them uh, type matter. If they don't know about it, so they didn't ask to have you recuse yourself from the case, but you do, you actually have an affirmative duty to withdraw yourself. Now, this does not apply, of course, if you disclose it and then they waive <clears throat> your disqualification and decide to move forward under 211C. Okay, the rule of necessity may override the rule of disqualification. Uh, so going, we're continuing with our comments here. We could have extenuating circumstances where you can't recuse yourself. And the classic situation is legal challenges to pay increases or salary freezes or things that affect the wages and compensation of judges, of all the judges in a state um, or let's say in the federal system or something like that. <clears throat> and what that means is there's no judge who's not affected by this. So if the, let's say the legislature free, does a salary freeze or is doing a pay increase or something like that for all the state court judges and some public interest group challenges that uh, for, for some reason, there are cases like this. Um, and and then they object to the judge. Or one of the parties will object to, well, this judge, it's their salary at stake. Well, if every, there is nobody else we could transfer the case to. So, um, and it kind of applies to every judge personally. So that's a situation where necessity requires that the judge stay on it. You may remember, remember that I mentioned earlier that um, the disqualification usually doesn't apply to the US Supreme Court. Now you will see uh, judges take no part in proceedings or recuse themselves. It's very often because they were involved in the matter um, when they were a circuit court judge before they go to the Supreme Court. Um, but the rules themselves don't apply. And uh, again, the main explanation is there's only nine of us. If somebody recuses themselves, um, then there's eight. We don't have a tiebreaker vote. Um, if we have three of us recuse ourselves, it undermines the legitimacy of having a nine uh, of the court because we have <clears throat> only part of the court even getting the way in on it and so forth. Also, immediate action matters, so a public emergency or something like that. Um, the judge should put on the record um, what the, uh, 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 disclose all of their reasons that they maybe should be disqualified but can't. Um, because it's some sort of urgent matter and, and, and there's no time to transfer it to another court. All of this should be explained on the record so that later on when the emergency is over, we can question this and scrutinize it. Okay, next. Um, the fact that a lawyer in a proceeding is affiliated with a law firm with which a relative of the judge is affiliated does not itself disqualify the judge. In other words, um, we're not gonna disqualify the judge for something that's kind of attenuated. The judge has a relative that works for this firm. That's not what we're concerned about. We're worried about a relative, close relative of the judge being a lawyer in the case. Um, on the other hand, if there's something here going on here that it would be reasonable for people to question the judge's impartiality, um, uh, under A, or the person uh, is known by the judge to have a substantial interest, recusal or disqualification is required. And this could be true even if it's not a direct relative. This could be um, your Bruce Wayne and we're talking about Alfred or something like that where it's kind of like family. <clears throat> um, you do have a duty even if you um, aren't sure that your uh, interest rises to the level of one that would require disqualification, you have a duty to go ahead and err on the side of disclosing it to the parties so that if necessary, they can make a motion and, uh, and object to it. So this is kind of a mandatory disclosure rule. Economic interest, this is a definition, um, means more than a de minimis a legal or equitable interest. And so sometimes I, I, uh, we see these things with highly contested cases where partisan pundits and commentators get really upset that a judge has some sort of attenuated financial 
um, stake or investment in one of the cases, we need, mean more than de minimis. And so it needs to be something substantial where there's actual concern that it is influencing the judge's decision. Um, now, the, wow, what a cluttered slide. I really couldn't f figure out a way to break this up. Um, and it's not all that important, except that this is the mutual fund rule. And so for my students who aren't really uh, familiar with how mutual funds and pension funds and things like that work, um, basically you put your investment in this fund and then there's um, fund managers who take this big pool of money from a lot of different people and they are constantly investing, buying and selling stocks and bonds and things like that with it to try to maximize the return of the whole pool. And a lot of times this also involves diversification. And so what this means is that this is different than owning stock because if you're a judge and you have money in a mutual fund or a pension fund, um, it could be maybe unbeknownst to you that on the day that you're uh, presiding over a trial that your mutual fund is um, all in on in one of the party's companies. And it's not because of you, it's just because of the, they, these are um, investors who are using very sophisticated financial analysis to decide where to stick money. And sometimes they leave these money, these investments in for a while and let them grow. And sometimes it's kind of like day trading where they're shifting money around a lot. Tomorrow, the money might not be there. But what we do know is that people who put money in the mutual fund don't have any control over those investment decisions. And so that doesn't come back on the judge and is not a grounds for recusal. There was a time probably 15 years ago now or, or more where there were some concerns that just claims that Justice Thomas should recuse himself from certain cases. Again, the code of judicial conduct doesn't really apply to the US Supreme Court, but also um, if I remember right, the case actually involved um, not direct stock holdings, but Justice Thomas had um, uh, invested money in a mutual fund, which in turn happened to be invested in that company. Now, if you aren't familiar with mutual funds, when you get your little reports, your earning reports from the mutual fund, a lot of times it actually does tell you what types of stocks, um, it, it, where they have put the money from the fund, which includes your money, because um, you're pooling it. And, um, and, and part of this is so that you can, if you don't like what the fund is, like you think that they're being dumb or you don't like the type of uh, places you don't want them investing in p p companies that pollute or companies that manufacture firearms or that exploit their workers or something like that, you can pull your money out and invest in another fund. But in general, this is enough steps to remove the decision making from um, the actual investor that the, <clears throat> the original investor, like the judge, that it's not grounds for the judge to recuse himself. And then um, uh, two is securities that are held by a nonprofit, basically, um, where the judge or the judge's spouse or family member is a director. Um, and so if you think about it, like if you, uh, if you have a judge who sits on the board at a major university, the big university has an endowment and the, and the endowment is uh, invested in a, heavily in a certain type of, uh, in a certain company. Again, it's enough steps to remove from the judge. It's not grounds for recusal. And the um, uh, membership in a credit union, same thing. It's too attenuated. You could make a, an argument, um, a technical argument that the judge has a financial stake, but um, because the pooling of the funds and the lack of control over the investment decisions, um, it's, uh, it does not merit recusal. And, um, and then interest in the issuer of a government security uh, that's held by the judge. So that kind of wraps up our lecture on 211. And again, have, it's one of the sections of the judicial code that's tested pretty frequently on the MPRE and the rules are not necessarily completely intuitive. And so I wanted to highlight it uh, for my students.